All right, we're going to let some people join in. One of the things that I would love to you, have you kind of reflect on as we're doing that is be thinking on this past week with uh, two questions. So question number one is how many hours did you work last week? And then what percentage of the time that you spent working would you say was your income producing activities? Your top 20%. Hi, Yvette. Thank you for joining. Uh, so the question that was asked is, what have you done? And I'm going to pull everybody over so that we have the opportunity um, to speak freely. You can unmute yourself and uh, everything else. So the question is, how many hours did you work last week? And what percentage of the time that you were uh, spending doing the activities were income producing activities? How many hours did I work last week? How many hours did you work last week? And how, uh, what percentage of the hours that you are top 20%? Uh, probably 10. 10 hours worked or 10%? Uh, 10 hours worked. Okay, so worked a total of 10 hours last week? Mm -hmm. And so how, how much of those 10 hours were lead generation activities or your top 20%? Probably eight. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Joyce said that she spent approximately 30 hours last week. Half of the time was lead gen and half was trying to figure stuff out. Okay. Debbie. And Gina, let's go ahead and get it to the point where we can see you. Uh, and then we'll get to the next phase, Sam as well, where we can hear from you. So the question is, how many hours did you work last week? And what percentage of those hours would you say was your 20%? Gina, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me? I'm adding. <laughs> okay. Sam, I can hear you. Okay, uh, Gina's you doing math. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead with Sam. Oh, it was just a quickie. I'd say it was probably about three to four hours a day. But of this, there was okay. definitely not enough lead generation. It was more... Um, uh, learning again, because I'm still in that kind of learning phase. So, you know, technology and, and learning how to do everything and also trying to put out fires with existing listings that I've got. Okay. So not enough new generation. Okay. Good. Gina? I had, because I showed three different groups, so I probably had about 30 hours and of that, um, what was the other question? The top <laughs> what percentage of it would you say was doing the top 20% of your activities? Oh, probably 80%. And for those that are not familiar with that conversation or what that means, we are identifying your top 20% as lead generation, lead follow-up, going on appointments, negotiating contracts, and scripts and role play. Those are the... Uh, the five things of the job description that equate to your highest income producing activities. Um, and so you said how much, Gina? Probably about 80%. Okay, good. This is just a check-in, right? Like this isn't a, this isn't shaming anyone for anything. If you had a lighter week, if you had a heavier week, whatever it might look like. The point is, is that I, if these questions aren't posed, 
I don't know who's asking them. I don't know when they're being reflected on. So that's why, why we're having that conversation. Debbie. So Michael, mine, I think oh, mine, muted, Debbie. Hold mine, on, sorry, ahead, I think mine changed to about 25 because you're thinking about, I'm thinking about the appointments that I did go on. I wasn't thinking about that. Like I showed properties in Vero, which was six hours. And then I also wrote two contracts. So it was about 25 last week. And, but physical lead generating and calling, I spent about eight hours. That's it, which I really would have liked to spend more on the actual lead generation point. Sure. Okay. Good. <clears throat> Debbie, try to talk. Let's see if we can hear you. No. <laughs> Nope, still can't hear you. We're trying. Okay. While you figure that out, just just keep screaming, and once you scream, I'll I'll be able to hear you. <laughs> uh, right. So having that conversation around the activities that you're doing, if we were to look, it's also that question around time blocking. We were talking about a little bit about this during the sales meeting and even in Power Up, which is, if I was to go to my calendar and look at all of the things that I have there, what are the items that I would put a dollar sign next to? Meaning that this is something that is income producing for me, for my business. It's just, it's always interesting to put that into perspective. Number one. Number two is I have this conversation often with people in coaching, which is what have you done this week to get new business? What have you done this week to get new business? And the reason that I ask that question is because we get so busy dealing with pre-existing listings. We get so busy showing buyers the 30th home. Well, we're all, we've already counted on that one buyer for the $7,000 paycheck, whatever that might be. We've already been anticipating that they will eventually buy something. And so therefore that's the income that I can count on. By the time that we're on the 30th showing with them, we've already counted and accounted for that money. So once they close, if we've spent all of our time working with pre-existing clients, not finding new clients, what we end up finding ourselves is that we have a check in hand and that we have no future business. That's why we're always having that conversation around doing the growing your business aspect in the morning and then being able to do the afternoon. Now, uh, how many of you would you say that you um, were in alignment with Rachel when she said that she feels like she's got really great structure in the morning from about 8, 10 until about noon. And then like the afternoon, it just completely all goes to the wayside. Are you finding that there's a certain part of the day that you have more structure than not? Remember, you're all muted. So if you try to talk, I'm not going to be able to hear you. Because I support you all the way. I think you're the best one. Debbie, we can hear you. We can. Okay. Yeah. Trying to move. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether whether I, I'll I'll contribute here. For me, it really makes no odds whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon. I have to work around the homeschooling that I do. So generally, I just try to do what I need to do with with my children, and then whatever other time I'm slotting in. I wish it could be more formal. You know what I mean, like a specific slot, but it just sure. it doesn't work necessarily that way. So it does mean that I I adapt. So no specific time. It doesn't matter whether I'm working at seven, four o'clock in the afternoon, or nine in the morning. So you're not finding that you naturally have a pocket of time that's a little bit more structured than others? No, I've just, I, I've had, I'm sorry. I mean, I know that does, that doesn't no, help please. really, but it's- No, I mean, if you were a plant, then you were, you're performing horribly and, and what I was planning, I'm just, I'm totally kidding, Sam. The point is, <laughs> is, you know, you, you, you're supposed to be transparent about what's happening and then figuring out ways of making that work. Um, we I have to juggle always, and I think a lot of, yeah. yeah, I think that a lot of women, though, in general, have to juggle. So I think that, you know, particularly if you have families and children, so it's not necessarily a case of, oh, I, I can block out that chunk of time. I can, I can aim for an hour, but I might be interrupted halfway through it and then have to, like, pick it up again at this point. Right. Absolutely. 
Uh, let's see. Joyce says that she's definitely feeling more structure in the morning. Um, Yvette, what would you say? Um, my morning is better, but then I pick back up probably around three o'clock. Um, I get about 11 and I take that break and then it's like three o'clock unless it's a really busy, like when it was Zoom calls and training classes, it was really busy. But the middle of the week really gets me because I used to take a Wednesday or Thursday off and show up properties on Saturday and Sunday. And now I'm in this six weeks where Saturday and Sunday is not always open houses, open houses and showing properties. It's more during the week. So I, I still have not adjusted to that middle of the week by Wednesday or Thursday. I'm just like, I don't want to make a phone call. I don't want to do anything. And I don't know where to get that motivation back into that habit and then now we're back to out of stay at home where we can start more people are showing properties on Saturday and Sunday so now I'm like getting back into that habit again where I was in a really good habit in taking a day off during the week to be able to function the weekend does that make sense yeah so for those that heard Yvette what would you say or would you recommend on how are you maintaining motivation after kind of the halfway point of the week? Or at this point, maybe you've just been going seven days a week and we're six weeks into this and you're just feeling exhausted. How are you maintaining motivation? I think we're not. <laughs> I'd say it's hard, but it's, it's, uh, finding either whether, you know, I've been finding these little funny little blogs or Pluto living or those different things on motivation, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or whatever, just to kind of push through to keep you going. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing with all of the juggling to maintain motivation? What am I doing with all the juggling? <laughs> well, I mean, we're here in a small apartment, so it's Todd on one side of the room and I'm either in the bedroom or out on the balcony so trying to uh, both work from home. So that's been my biggest issue is just juggling where my office is for the moment. <laughs> but it's, it's happening. I'm actually busier now, I think, than I was before. Okay, good. Sam, how are you, how are you keeping motivated? You're muted. I think what I'm doing is, first of all, just making sure that um, I'm trying to stay really positive. I'm trying to um, reach out to people who I haven't done for a long time. Um, and I've already discovered that just by asking, you know, past buyers, that really, honestly, I feel really bad now. I mean, I have seriously just taken for granted over the years you know, worked with them, then just expected them to just come back to me six years, seven years later, which many of them have done. But I know that a few have slipped through the net and I'm not gonna let that happen again. So in reaching out to past buyers and asking that question, and in fact, using the exchange rate. Um, I've got a situation right now with past Canadian buyers who bought from me a number of properties, but one in, in Windermere, when they bought, Six years ago, the exchange rate was very different than it is now. And just in that exchange rate, they can make something like $160,000 in the exchange rate on the property. And that's with the property not actually increasing very much in price. Um, so been working out some numbers, reaching out to people and, you know, just putting it out there that you might want to consider. So just trying to stay you? focused, try and keep busy. Debbie? Sorry. Can, how, can how you are, hear me? How are, yeah, how are you keeping motivated? Um so far it's been it's it's been pretty good. Um, you know, just keeping up the morning habits, like I think most of us are, you know, I have power up, I feel like I need to report in every morning. And trying to keep the momentum that we had going, which was pretty good. Um, and so, you know, and trying to keep those people on target for just being delayed and not gone. 
So I've been sort of focused on them. And, um, and honestly, that's probably kept me going that and the care cause and actually the care cause have gone a long way towards keeping me motivated because they've been so good and so responsive. And it made me feel good. And so I kept going. And then I've got kids sitting here looking at me all day going, how are we going to pay for college and go on vacation this year, mom? That was a strong motivator. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, we kind of fixed the vacation part, so that part. Yeah, uh, <laughs> your vacation's <laughs> done. We've been doing it, <laughs> forcefully. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Marsh, I see that you've joined us, and Steve, you've joined us. Would love to hear kind of your thought process. The conversation that we're having is just to check in on how many hours a week we're working, what that looks like in terms of the percentage of the work that we're doing that is the actual lead generation, the top 20%, those activities that we're doing. And I talk about this often, that there's a difference between business and busyness, right? So the busyness of business is something that for a lot of us, we get confused in being bogged down by all of the details, being bogged down by all of the technology, being bogged down by all of the training that sometimes we actually aren't applying any of the activities that we want to to our business we have the best of intentions and we never get around to them uh, and i think that it's just it's very important to be having that conversation myself included i had said that you know during this opportunity i wanted to go back through and i wanted to clean up the database and realize this morning when teaching ignite like i have not time blocked to go in and do what i needed to do to clean up the sphere so that we can do a custom newsletter to those people that would be identified as our VIP. And since I'm the only person who can do that based on the relationships that I have and can see, you know, who really should be identified, it's one of those things that I can't leverage the way that I would like to leverage some of the other things. So I think it's very important that you're looking at your calendar and saying what on this is absolutely important, right? And we talked about this before in Ignite, and it's a good thing to revisit, is that if you're a to-do lister, um, and I know that a lot of you are, um, that the problem with to-do lists is that everything that's on the to-do list looks like it's important. And Rachel was talking a little bit about this with the Ben Kinney podcast, um, but this comes straight out of Ignite. So the idea of taking your to-do list, taking out a new piece of paper and drawing a quadrant so you're going to draw a line down the middle and then uh, a horizontal line down the middle as well. So you've got four quadrants. And in the top left quadrant, you're going to put urgent and important. So we want urgent and important. Let me see if I can butcher this because I love drawing on the computer because it looks so horrible when I do it. Um, but you can just be entertained here for a moment. <laughs> So I wasn't trying to do a circle, but apparently it's a circle. So, uh, you know, we've got our quadrant here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do urgent and important. We're going to do urgent, not important. important, not urgent. And then we're going to do not urgent. I can spell not important. Michael, what is your example of an urgent, not important? Because to me, urgent means it is slightly important. But is this like, oh, I've got to get the dog groomed. It's not important, but kind of need to do it. Is that what we're? Uh, no, I would say like in and I, I've, I've gotten someone yelled at me when I gave this example, but we're just, we're just going to go with it. So imagine that you have a teenage kid. Mm -hmm. That kid needs to be picked up and, it, and somehow needs to come home at some point today. Can totally relate to that, yes. You do not physically have to be the one to go pick up the kid. Mm -hmm. You might be able to leverage 
another one of your kids. You might be able to leverage the kid's friend. You might be able to leverage the kid's friend's mom who's already going to do the carpool thing, right? Like there, you might have some sport. And then of course I get this answer from the one single mom who's like, no, you don't understand. I'm the only one who takes care of my kid. I have nobody who lives in Tampa. Okay, thank you, you proved me wrong. Find another example. The point here is that it would be urgent that your kid get home. It's not important, not that it's not important that your kid get home. It's not important, meaning it's not important that you be the only one who can do it. Gotcha. Okay. Right? Yep. So uh, another example of this might be like, I, not not lately, because right, I'm wearing my 42 black t-shirts. I can literally go a month and a half without <laughs> like washing so that's great. Uh, but not my body, of course, you know, the clothes. And but before when things were dry cleaned, right, getting my dry cleaning because I have no more clean slacks, I have no more clean shirts would be urgent because if I don't, then it's going to be very awkward for the next day. Yet it's not important that I be the one to go physically pick it up. I'm 